It's someone local. I forget what team it is, though. Somebody in the first session, this was their robot, and he's talked about it a little bit. Um, but the, uh, you can see their, their grabber mechanism. This is from last year, so they were using that to pick up the, the large balls. They've got two cylinders here, uh, kind of a symmetrical arrangement. They're going to put pressure to those to either open those jaws up or close those jaws. They've got another cylinder here, um, and you can imagine that when that rod extends, this whole mechanism is going to rotate. And I think he said they've got another one here, and the thought there was that this whole that's, thing can that's the next up one. In here. So basically that can rotate forward, the jaws can open, it can pick itself up, grab a ball, come back down with it. Um, the guy that was in the first session said that they had problems with that cylinder and that it wasn't, they didn't have enough air capacity to be able to run that enough times during their match to work properly. Um, and I'm not going to get into the sizing, uh, it's kind of a whole different discussion, but there is a, I'll reference it at the end here, there's a really good presentation given at last year's national competition on just that, uh, kind of a lot of the things to take into account when you're figuring out how big your cylinders need to be, what their stroke length needs to be, how many air tanks you want to have, um, a lot of that stuff. So that's all very important. We just don't really have time to talk about that today. Here's a different view. You can see that big long cylinder. That's the one that they were having all the trouble with. Um, this is anybody's? No, it's Amy's. That's mine. <laughs> um, did you want to say anything about it? I was just going to say, we had problems because there was a cylinder on that back side that lifted the entire front arm back up, and we realized it too late that, based on wording, that our diameter was too big on our cylinder. So just make sure you're following the rules when you're doing that. We really didn't have any other problems with pneumatics except for we had the wrong size cylinder and had to redesign it in three days. So. Yeah, and cylinders, uh, they're all going to be custom built. So uh, once you make your decision on what you're using, that might be what you're stuck with. You might not be able to get a different one in time, uh, especially depending on when you figure out it's not the right one. So definitely, you know, measure twice, cut once, figure out ahead of time exactly what you want, and get that. Um, so you can see here, I, I found this interesting. This robot here had a jaw mechanism that opened and closed, and they used two cylinders. And this one here has a jaw mechanism that opened and closed, and they used one cylinder. So there's, you know, Tons of different ways to do whatever it is you're trying to do. Uh, it's kind of a fun thing to, to be able to sit down and break um, Different view of the same robot. So outside of the main competition goal, there's a lot of, I guess what I'd call auxiliary functions that you could use pneumatics for. Um, one of the ones I found most prevalent was gearboxes. So typically when you're building your drivetrain, you have to make a decision whether you want to be a fast robot or a powerful robot ratio kind of dictates which one you are. You can get a two-speed gearbox that kind of gives you the best of both worlds. Uh, I think this is the best picture. Where this particular gear ratio is maybe set up for speed, and then when the cylinder's down here, they haven't put their tube into it yet, but when this shifts, it actually disengages these two gears and engages <coughs> these two gears. And now you've got a different gear ratio, and you can be a powerful robot and a fast robot, um, and, and like I say, get the best of both worlds. This one was really interesting, uh, a braking mechanism. So they actually have a physical brake that prevents them from being pushed or prevents their wheels from turning. Um, you know, maybe once you get into it, you find that you're getting pushed around, and you wish that your design couldn't be back driven. Um, a pneumatic brake, you know, just applying pressure to that wheel is going to prevent it from spinning, which might help you either be, prevent being pushed or keep yourself stationary while you're trying to move your apparatus around. Um, it seems like every time I logged on, I found something different that I hadn't seen before. So, I mean, really, anything where motion is required, you can use pneumatics. It's very flexible. Um, there is no like set of things you can do with it. You can do just about anything. So, extra tips here. Um, something just to keep in mind is to document everything. Um, pneumatics and robot wide, just a general tip. Document everything. It's really going to help you in your design process from your concept to the first thing that didn't work to the second thing that didn't work to finally getting down to the end. Um, and 
and being able to have a paper trail to see all the things that you tried is really helpful. It will also help in judging too, so all the engineering awards, if you can show your process, that really helps the judges understand. Um, and kind of a footnote to that is use schematics. And schematics, I haven't talked about yet, but the pneumatics industry has created schematic symbols to represent every component that you could put into a pneumatic system. And this gives you a way of thinking about it, drawing it out, um, troubleshooting it, brainstorming and how to do different things. Everybody speaks the same language of schematics. And this was pulled out of the pneumatics manual as well. And they did a really good job here of having a pictorial view of the system. And then on the very next page, they've got the schematic view of that system kind of laid out in the same manner. So you can go through, you can look at it, you can say, OK, I see this symbol here. OK, that's the compressor. Oh, I see these. That's the, the air tanks. Um, and this is just really important to document your system, to know what you're trying to do. You can see what happens. These are all the directional valves. So you can see that when this valve is de-energized, air is coming in, and it's going to be going to the rod into the cylinder, making it retract. And when you shift it, air, and you can imagine this portion of the symbol shifting over here, air is then going to be diverted to the cap end of the cylinder, and it's going to make it extend. So these different cylinder or different valve schematic symbols represent different types of valves. And depending on that spool that we talked about that's inside the valve, they make those in tons of different configurations, which is going to give you a different valve function. Um, so like I say, this one is either a, always retracting or always extending. Um, None of these valves have a center condition, but you could have a valve where de-energized, you're in the center condition, nothing's happening. Energized, you're retracting, and energized in the other direction, you're extending. Um, and that's really one of the most common valves you're going to find. The rules, um, one of the comments I got from the Portland area was that um, people don't didn't read the rules closely enough and only found out that they were breaking them once they got the competition. The pneumatic rules especially are very strict. They're laid out um, because this and the electrical system first uses you know, a safety conscious area of the system. So they kind of want to dictate how it's used and how you do it. And because of that, they really don't allow you a lot of leeway to do your own thing, or at least use your own components. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can do with the components they provide. So, they kind of give you what I'll call a white list of components. And if it's not on their list, you probably can't use it. Um, they supply the compressor, the valves, the tubing, the, everything. Uh, really, the only thing you can do is get additional things of those that they supply. So if you want more valves, you can get more valves, as long as they're just like the valves that they supply. Uh, if you want more regulators, you can get more regulators. Uh, what you can't do is get another compressor, one and only one compressor. Um, like Amy kind of mentioned, vacuum devices and gas shocks, they're both pneumatic in nature. Um, so it first kind of comes out and says, we know these devices operate under the same principles, but we don't consider them part of the pneumatic system. So they stipulate that they're allowed and that they're not governed by these rules. So just be aware of that if your team decides to use those. Um, also be aware that if you want to use pneumatics, you have to do certain things. Um, like I talked about, you have to have the system safety relief valve, you have to have the lead valve, you have to have the pressure switch. So you can't just decide, oh, well, let's use this compressor and this valve and this cylinder. You have to, have to use at least part of those components or else you won't have a valid system. And finally, no modifications.